Leadership and Virginia Department of Environmental Quality Update, Mr. Smedley. Welcome, Mr. Smedley. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. As part of our environmental stewardship agenda item, we have DEQ here to present a overview of their programs and authorities within the county. So, first we have um, Sean Weimer, the land protection manager, and he oversees the waste management programs. Mr. Weimer. Welcome. Thank you. Um, good to see everybody. This is my first time at a Board of Supervisors meeting, so um, I appreciate the invite from Scott. Uh, I'm actually filling in today for James Golden. He's our regional director and also our director, the agency's director of regional operations. Um, he was unable to, unable to make the meeting today, so um, I'm happy to provide an overview of kind of where DEQ is as it relates to our regulatory programs in relation to the county. And then also I want to talk a little bit about landfills as well, since that's kind of my area of expertise. So here, this is just a, uh, a map of DEQ as in terms of our regional offices. Uh, I work in our Piedmont office, which is represented by yellow on the map. We have 30 counties um, that comprise the Piedmont uh, jurisdiction, which obviously includes Chesterfield. Uh, in terms of the water programs, there's uh, you know, the Clean Water Act, and we have approximately 81 permitted uh, VIPTES facilities in, in Chesterfield County. So that ranges anywhere from wastewater treatment plants to industrial stormwater general permit facilities, uh, Proctor's Creek, Fallen Creek, those are some of your large wastewater treatment plants. Also, you have some, some large industrial facilities like DuPont, uh, Dominion, um, you know, those are all in the, in, in the county as well. Uh, some of the other general permits that apply are like there's uh, one for vehicle wash water discharges and also non-potable uh, um, uh, drinking water or non-contact non uh, cooling water uh, discharges. In terms of some of the construction-related permits, uh, Chesterfield is the VSMP authority versus DEQ. Some, some localities are the VSMP authority. Uh, what that means is the county administers the construction uh, stormwater general permit. So when a, uh, uh, somebody needs to apply for an application, they submit the plans and the registration statement uh, to the county and then the county works with DEQ. DEQ actually issues the permits, so there's some coordination with our central office, and then that construction stormwater general permit is issued. And then also another construction-related permit is our VWP permits, which is Virginia Water Protection Program. There's approximately 155 general and individual permits currently in the county, and uh, those general permits are, are dependent on the size of the impacts, you know, in terms of wetlands and streams, um, and, and also the, t the type of activity is what determines what type of general permit it is, and then the larger uh, projects uh, require an individual permit. In terms of the AIR program, we have 65 uh, regulated facilities currently. Uh, those range from true miners to synthetic miners to majors, and those are dependent on the type of emissions and also the amount of emissions being being released is what determines what type of permit is needed. Uh, there's a few examples there, uh, large manufacturing facilities, hospitals, um, uh, the Shoe Smith Landfill, they, they have an air permit for, um, uh, for their emissions out there. Uh, in terms of land protection, which is really the waste program, that's what I work in. Um, we have subtitle C, which is your hazardous waste, and then uh, subtitle D, solid waste. And in Chesterfield, we have four active landfills, Shoe Smith, Taylor Road, Skin Quarter, and Dominion. Uh, Dominion's an industrial landfill, uh, captive industrial landfill. And then Shoe Smith is a sanitary landfill where they receive municipal solid waste and also construction demolition debris waste. Uh, Taylor Road and, and Skin Quarter are both CDD uh, facilities. Uh, enclosed landfills, there's um, uh, three that are owned by Chesterfield, the Chester, Bon Air, and Northern Area landfills. Uh, permit by rules, those are, uh, 
So you have your solid waste facilities that have a like an individual permit, an SWP permit, which uh, applies to those those four uh, landfills I mentioned uh, above. So you have also other solid waste management facilities have to have a, it's called a permit by rule PBR, and in Chesterfield there's four of those. You have Agape Pet Services, uh, Stericycle, uh, Watkins Nursery, and then County Waste at Shoesmith. So Agape and and Stericycle are regulated medical waste facilities. And then Watkins Nurseries is a uh, composting facility. And then county, the county waste at Shoesmith, that's a materials recovery facility. So they bring in different um, uh, materials that are going to be re recycled. So they come in and then they sort them at that facility. I uh, just wanted to kind of talk briefly about some of the differences between sanitary and construction demolition debris landfills. Um, with sanitary landfills like Shoesmith, they're required to, to put, a, put on six inches of daily cover every day, whereas at a CDD landfill, the, the cover requirement is at the end of the work week uh, with one foot. Uh, they can cover more, but in terms of the regu regulatory requirements, um, it's once per week. Um, municipal solid waste uh, is, is not permitted at CDD landfills, but CDD is permitted at sanitary landfills. So, Shoesmith is able to, to receive municipal solid waste and also CDD materials, whereas uh, Skin Quarter and Taylor Road only receive CDD waste. They're not receiving um, putrescible trash household waste. Landfill gas management plans are required uh, at both types of landfills unless there's demonstration uh, that a CDD landfill um, isn't going to produce methane gas. Um, but for example, there's a landfill gas management plan in place at uh, Skin Quarter, and they have um, uh, monitoring probes to measure methane that might be uh, potentially migrating off-site. Um, so there's there's probes at the at the facility boundary for that purpose. Uh, leachate control and groundwater monitoring is required at both. So at these facilities, they have systems in place to collect the leachate, and then it's um, usually uh, uh, pumped and hauled either off-site to like a wastewater treatment plant or they might have a direct discharge to a sanitary line that goes to a, a wastewater treatment plant. And then groundwater, groundwater monitoring is required at both facilities as well. So there's a monitoring network that's in place at all the landfills and uh, those landfills are required to submit reports to DEQ periodically and we have uh, professional geologists who evaluate the data at those facilities. Um, inspections at landfills, our inspection year is usually October 1 through September 30th, and we put together a risk-based inspection schedule towards the end of the summer. Um, currently, uh, in terms of Chesterfield, we're, we're inspecting the, the Taylor Road and Skin Quarter and uh, Dominion facilities quarterly, and then we have Shoe Smith um, on our schedule for six times a year. And when we go out and do inspections, we're looking at, you know, their records. Uh, that includes, you know, waste received, facility self-inspections, self leachate collection, and gas monitoring. So waste received, we're looking to make sure, you know, what, what they're permitted for is what they're, what they're receiving. Also evaluating the amounts that are coming in. Um, self-inspections is something the facility is required to do in terms of walking around the facility and documenting any issues that they find. And then, you know, recording that information so that it's available, you know, when we come out to do an inspection. Um, and then leachate collection, we're, we're always looking at the records just to see how much leachate they're generating, making sure that it's going off-site to a, a, a proper um, disposal facility like a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, gas monitoring, we're evaluating the, the gas data to make sure that there's no um, exceedances of methane above the lower exposure. Expo uh, explosion limit um, at the facility boundary, which is 5% methane is, is the LEL. Uh, unauthorized waste. Uh, facilities are required to do uh, random load inspections to make sure that what's coming in is, is what's allowed. It's a, um, there's a, a requirement for a certain amount of in-state waste to be evaluated and also the uh, uh, amount of out-of-state waste to be evaluated. The numbers increase with out-of-state. I think it's 1% of the loads for in-state and 10% for um, out-of-state loads. 
and we review that information to make sure, say, a, a, a municipal or a CDD facility is not receiving municipal, you know, waste. That's part of our inspection process. And and just to stop, uh, Mr. Chair. So is that part of the record keeping? The, yes. The, Yes. The facility's record keeping requires them to keep records of these random load inspections. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we evaluate that when we do inspections. Um, and then in some cases, a CDD facility will receive a, a load of municipal solid waste and they, they have to reject that load and then send it to a facility that's permitted to, to accept it. So they could send it to Shoesmith, for example, if they receive a load of, of MSW. And we're looking for that documentation as well when we're doing an inspection. Like, okay, they to see if they received a load of MSW on this date and what, how they handled it. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Carroll. I, I know we're getting to the point where we're gonna be able to ask questions. Yeah, you're fine. So, um, relating to those inspections that, that they actually have, records that they have to keep themselves because it's self-inspecting, right? Yes. Uh, are there videos? Are there pictures? What type of records are actually kept for, the, for your organization to inspect when you come in to look at what has actually been dumped on site? It's paper records. I'm not aware that there's any video footage of them doing, say, a, a random load inspection. Uh, we do our own random load inspections, if you will, when, we, when we're out on site. So when we're on site, inspectors are looking at the trucks coming in, you know, physically dumping the waste on the, uh, the working face. And then inspectors are walking around the working face, and they're looking at the waste that's been dumped, you know, dumped there recently to evaluate whether there's any, um, any MSW in it, any, anything that, that, you know, potentially is hazardous, any regulated medical waste. Like if you see like a red bag, you know that's a that's that's a concern. Um, so it's it's being done and it's 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 documented uh, via paper and you know computers, but it's it's not recorded as as far as I know. So there's really no way you know what's under the pile unless you were there to inspect it. We're trusting that they're actually reporting what's actually going in honestly. That's correct. Okay. There has been. Um, Mr. Chair, if I can continue. Please. Um, more complaints than I can even count. I suppose if I sat down for an hour or two, I might be able to total them all up about the skin quarter landfill. You talked about testing on site for methane that escapes uh, to, determine, to make sure that it's not escaping at safe levels. But what type of testing is done in, re in relation to the hydrogen sulfide smell uh, that's coming out of the, the landfill right now. And as it's been explained to us over and over again, and it's because of sheetrock that's in the ground that's decomposing. What type of testing is done on site to determine what level that is um, coming out of there? I'm not sure if Skin Quarter is currently, you know, performing any periodic monitoring of H2S monitoring. It's it, for H2S. It's not something that is currently required, but they might be doing that just to uh, get an idea of what kind of H2S is present. Um, one of the things that I've seen facilities do before, when they have, say, an odor management plan in place, is they might have that might be part of their odor management plan, where they have a company come in and install. H2S monitors that are, you know, reading that data um, continuously so that they know at different times of the day what type of H2S readings they're, they're getting on site or off site. So is skin quarter on a, uh, an odor management plan? Not yet, no, sir. Um, if they go on an odor management plan, will that be part of what's required of them is to do these type of testing? It, it could be. Um, so the way that works is once DEQ requests a facility to develop an odor management plan, they submit a plan to us. Uh, we look at it, offer some feedback, you know, on, on the plan. Um, and we have a, kind of an open dialogue on, you know, what we would recommend be included in the plan. Um, and in fact, we're, we're planning a, an upcoming meeting out at Skin Quarter uh, we wanted to do it last week, but actually their consultant wasn't going to be available until the week after this. Uh, so hopefully next week we're going to be getting together and meeting with uh, facility personnel out at Skin Quarter to talk about, um, you know, the long-term plans as it relates to addressing odor issues out there. 
So with the over the past year, and it's been over a year that these complaints have been coming in, has any steps been taken by your agency to set up any type of testing equipment to test the air um, as it's coming off site to determine how many parts per million uh, is coming out of the ground that could affect the people who live adjacent and across the street and downwind of the landfill? No, sir. We have not set up any air monitoring devices through our air program to test H2S. Is it possible to do that? Um, yes, I think it's possible. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that process would work. I'd have to talk with folks in our air monitoring program, but I do know that DEQ has done um, testing similar to that um, at other facilities in the past. Okay. Um, obviously, there's a concern uh, uh, for me and for the people who live out in that area of long-term prolonged exposure uh, to this type of gas. Um, if you uh, do research on this, even basic research, Googling it, uh, not to give Google a, a, a free shot or, or free press here, but that's the one I used. Um, uh, this type of gas, even OSHA requires uh, for long-term exposure for employees to actually have, uh, take protective measures to protect themselves from exposure. Uh, and so if we're not monitoring uh, the levels that's coming out, uh, we have no idea what we're exposing our people to out there and for how long, and it's a real big concern. So what happens when someone calls DEQ and makes a complaint, and look, I'm not trying to be mean here, but no, you're fine. <laughs> you know, you're the, 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 the expert on this for the organization, and I know that there are, this is something that's affecting the district every day out there. And so when someone files a complaint, what happens to the complaint and what type of follow-up is given to the people who filed the complaint? Well, when we receive a complaint, um, it's a combination of getting in touch with the, the person who uh, reported the, the odor and then also letting the landfill know. Um, we document all the complaints and we have them all in our uh, electronic database, so we keep track of them and we uh, monitor those, you know, and uh, no, notate them when we go out to do our next inspection report or in, in next inspection. So on a quarterly basis, we're, we're tracking that information. Um, and we've been doing that with, with Skin Quarter. And in the case of Skin Quarter, you know, we've met with the facility. Um, we actually met with Chesterfield in, in October to discuss the, fa the facility and other landfills. And um, we, we gave them the opportunity to put together some um, remediation uh, plans and proposals, and they started implementing those. Um, I think it was probably mid-October, uh, sometime around then, where they actually had a system. Uh, they have a remediation system on site that's pulling uh, gas from the landfill, and it's putting it through like a biofilter. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we learned recently that, in fact, we just went out there and did an inspection on February uh, 7th, a quarterly inspection, a routine inspection. And we learned that they are making changes to that system. Um, and that was the first that we learned of that. So um, that's, um, that's one of the reasons why we want to have a meeting with them to kind of figure out what their plans are um, moving forward over the long term. And then also to discuss the, the, the possibility of requiring the facility to put together an odor management plan. Um, Chair, one more. Please. What does it take to shut down a landfill? In other words, how many complaints does it take from the community on this type of odor before something can be done to stop them from until they get a, a system in place that can actually provide uh, remediation? What, what options does your agency have to do that? Because that's what I'm getting from the people out there is we want them shut down until they figure out how to control the smell. From our agency, um you know, that's a tricky one. I think um, I, I, I think the shutting down a landfill it would probably start at the local level. Um, a landfill can operate if it doesn't have a conditional use permit, which is a local, you know, uh, um, document. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of a situation where we've, gone through a process to shut down a landfill because of odors. Um, 
And I don't know if that helps answer your question or not. No, no, it, it is helpful. Um, what I understand that you said that they have uh, water quality testing that they do. I'm assuming they have test wells on site yes, that they test. Is there any other options for people who live in the community who are afraid that something may be leaching out into their into the groundwater, into their wells? And do or does your organization do any testing like that? For example, downstream, Saponi Creek is downstream from uh, this um, landfill. Uh, is it periodically tested to determine that nothing is leaching out and that the line has not been uh, compromised? I'm not aware of any uh, testing that's done on S Saponi Creek. Um, we have a water monitoring program with DEQ, so we're, we're collecting samples from, you know, the rivers and streams all over the state. Um, I'm not sure if that's one of them. Um, if, it, if it is, I don't believe it's related to the fact that there's a, there's a landfill upstream. Um, there is that possibility in some circumstances where our water monitoring program will be directed to collect additional samples because of a, a, a landfill or an industrial facility or something that could be potentially impacting the, 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 the stream. Um, you know, this landfill started receiving waste, the skin cord landfill that is, started receiving waste in 2019. So it's pretty, it's pretty young in terms of you know, facility operations. Um, we don't have any indication to believe that there's any contamination you know, migrating off site based on groundwater data. Um, but um, so yeah, I'm not aware of, uh, of, of any of any testing plans that are in place for that for that creek as it relates to the landfill being there. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Other other questions, Mr. Engel. I have several. Um, to just go back to Mr. Carroll's on skin quarter. I know we've received some um, concerned people talking about tanker trucks going in there. As I looked into that, it looked like they were going in to remove the leachate. Is that? Okay? Yes, sir. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was out there, that they're not bringing something in to dump there. They're actually pulling the, way, the uh, liquid materials that come from the products that come in. They're actually pulling that out of there to take it to another location that's certified to allow that to come in, right? You're exactly right. And they have a large tank on site. Um, don't quote me on this, it's probably 500,000 gallons. It's a large tank and their system directs their leachate that's collected you know, under, under the cells, it directs it to that tank and then they have tanker trunks that are coming in and filling up the leachate and then hauling it off to a permitted wastewater treatment facility. Because I am concerned about the smell as well. I just wanted to make sure that we could put some people's fears to rest on the tanker trucks they see going in there. Um, yes. that's. That's a great point. So a couple other questions. Um, industrial um, storm water runoff. If um, you had, say, a large chip manufacturing plant, that would end up requiring a DEQ permit for a storm water um, runoff, correct? Uh, like computer chips? Yes. Um, it might or it might not. It depends on what, uh, what's going to be exposed to storm water. So we have a lot of industrial facilities that do everything indoors, and if they're doing everything indoors, then uh, and there's no exposure to their industrial activities in terms of you know, stormwater hitting it and then running off the site, then they may not be required to have a permit. Now, if they have materials stored outside, um, depending on their uh, SIC code, their standard industrial classification code, that's kind of what we work off of to determine whether a facility is required to have a general permit or not. And if they have discharge of um, chemicals that are all inside that are used through the process that would then go through a uh, regular um, sewer system, is there a DEQ side of that or is that just the county regulates the um, outflow on that? It's really, it's really the county. Um, so the county would issue a pretreatment permit. Um, and, and then um, DEQ is involved with uh, evaluating a locality's pretreatment program, but it's the locality that issues the permit limits, you know, for that discharger. And it's usually the county that's going out and inspecting that facility to make sure what they're sending to the wastewater treatment plant is, is okay. 
And then um, I have my own uh, dump in my area. So a couple questions on that. Um, I, I'm hoping that the air quality in the area just gets better because of the um, new um, system they're putting in to collect the methane and turn that over to natural gas. I'm hoping that significantly helps. But um, the complaint that I get more often even than odor, believe it or not, is that the roads, they're, they're hauling um, mud out on their tires. Is there anything DEQ can do on wheel washes or something that can help that area so that, because um, we call them and we ask them to clean up and they usually do, but <laughs> that it doesn't stop when it's rainy like it will be for the next couple of days. We get complaints for the next week after that that people can't even see the lines on the road on Route 10 because of all the mud. Is there anything in place to help prevent that from happening? Yes, um, they're required to, um, or our regs require them to limit the uh, amount of material that's tracking out onto roadways. Um, and in fact, uh, we just issued back in November, early November, a notice of violation to, to the Shoesmith landfill um, based on inspections that we had performed. One of the items documented in that NOV um, you know, this is all public documents. One of the uh, items documented in the NOV was related to that issue that you described. Uh, so our enforcement program is working with the facility to come up with, with solutions as it relates to that and to learn more about what they're, they're currently doing. Well, I'm glad you're already working on that. Um, but citizens, are, I, I, I have definitely received complaints since then multiple times that um, people can't even see the lines on the road, and that's such a safety hazard. We just need to figure that out. I thought maybe wheel wash, it, it's expensive, but it may be the best way they could um, keep that material on site and not track it off of site. Yeah, no, that's that's a good idea. Uh, one of the challenges that we're we're facing out there is, as you know, there's multiple industrial facilities that are located there. Some uh, of them come out of Vulcan, the old Vulcan that are going straight on to ten. Some of them are coming right. out in front of their buildings. So I do understand that, but we got to do something because we cannot allow those. If you can't see the lines on the road, that truly is a safety hazard. No, understood. Thank you. Mr. Chair, one last question. Yes, Mr. Carroll. Um, you said you cover 30 counties for this particular area. Is that right? Yes, sir. Right. How much staff do you have to cover 30 counties for inspections? Um, that's a great point, and one that I actually wanted to make uh, myself. Uh, we have two solid waste inspectors in my program that's responsible for those 30 counties. We have uh, approximately 80 solid waste facilities. That includes... Uh, active landfills, closed landfills, and then also the PBRs I mentioned earlier. So there's uh, 80 facilities. Those two inspectors are, you know, you saw the map earlier. They're going to to, to the um, to the northern neck and you know all over that that region inspecting those facilities. And um, in terms of workload, that's why we kind of are able to get out to these facilities uh, um, as you know as often as we do. So quarterly, um, you know, is, is kind of the baseline for an active landfill. Some of the PBR facilities we don't go out to as often um, based on their compliance history and their operations. We don't need to visit them as often. Some of your larger facilities like a Shoesmith landfill, uh, we've added a couple more inspections to their, uh, to their schedule, which is why we're going out there six times per year versus quarterly. So. Um, that being said, are you, do you have the ability that, for example, because of the, the large amount of complaints we've received out here, do you have the ability to ask for additional help from other um, districts uh, in case you had to increase your inspections, as an example, for this location, whether you want to do, for example, surprise inspection in the morning at all the trucks that are lined up on Hull Street waiting to get in the dump to see what's actually in the trucks, right. um, which is, again, what people have been calling for to happen uh, so that because once it's under the ground and once it's covered, the smell eventually comes out of the ground, but you guys have no idea what was put on the dirt. So do you have the ability to ask for help from other areas of the state? Um, we do have the ability to work share as an agency, um, but I do know that all of our programs are 
at least our solid waste program throughout the state is pretty tight in terms of personnel. Um, one of the things that I think is worth noting as it relates to like the MSW that's been uh, notated on some of the trucks going into the skin quarter landfill, those trucks are used for uh, the, the, the facilities receiving waste uh, on those trucks and those trucks are used for MSW in some localities and then bringing in CDD uh, to skin quarter. So I know it's confusing when, when the public sees that MSW label on there but we've investigated that several, on several occasions. And um, heck, I think when I was out there one time with an, an inspector, we saw a truck come in with MSW and, and we watched it dump and there was nothing but CDD in there. So, um, you know, we can help with that message if, if folks continue to, um, to, to believe there's MSW going in there. Sorry, Mr. Chair, one last question. Wait. One more. When you do it, they do the inspections. You said most of the inspections of paper. Do they actually keep uh, a record of what percentage of their loads could actually be sheetrock? Um, as it was presented by the applicant when they applied for this permit, they said that the, the loads would be limited to 3%, three to 5 percent of the load would be actual sheetrock. So when they take their records and what's being dumped, are they actually doing an estimate or a calculation as what percentage of a load is actual sheetrock or what percentage of the road is any material for that matter? In terms of a breakdown of the different materials? Mm -hmm. um, I'd have to get back with you on that, Mr. Carroll. I, I don't believe that they're evaluating the loads to determine what percentage is sheetrock. Um, I do know that they're not supposed to receive any designated, you know, full loads of sheetrock at one time. They're not supposed to have a load come in there that's all sheetrock. Um, and I'd have to get back to you on, the, on, on, on whether they do keep records of, okay, this is how much uh, concrete or uh, wood debris or sheetrock that's coming in. I don't know if they break it down in those percentages, but I can find out. Thank you. Appreciate your information today. Yeah, no problem. Um, I got a couple as well. I'm okay. sorry. No, you're fine. Um, so from June 2017 to September 2021, there's been about 5,000, give or take, complaints about odor at Shoesmith. And so my question really just deals with how uh, DEQ uh, enforces um, odor. And you've gone into some of that some. Um, when an air sample is taken, uh, where, who takes that air sample and the chemical content of that air sample has got to be reported, I'm sure, somehow. Where is that data and who keeps that data? Does DEQ keep that data or is it sort of different depending on what it is? I, I guess I'm, I'm interested in verifying some conclusory remarks that have been made about whether or not some of these smells cause health concerns or health issues in human beings? If, if the landfill is performing their own monitoring, say like in the Highlands neighborhood or something, if, if they're doing that monitoring, they would, have, they would be the best folks to have that information in terms of the lab data. Um, I'm not aware that there's any, any air monitoring requirements and submittal of data required by our air program for that facility, but there might be. Um, but I, I'm not aware of Could any- you check on that for us, please? Yes, Thank yes, you. I can. Um, I'll check to see whether they have, so with Skin Quarter, it's a Title V uh, facility, so they have an air permit, and they have an odor management plan that's required um, by the, the Title V regulations. It's also addressed in their solid waste permit as well. Um, but they have to submit an annual report to us, um, I think it's by March, the end of March. And it, it, you know, it documents the, the complaints, what they're doing to address the complaints, uh, whether they're doing, um, you know, I think I call it uh, surface emission monitoring, SEM monitoring, where they're, they're going around and trying to determine whether they have pipes and stuff that might be leaking methane, um, you know, from the landfill. But um, yeah, I can check on that. So in, in the event that a operator of a landfill is keeping those chemical 
makeups of those air samples. Um, and I'm, I'm presuming there's no requirement then that they turn those over to DEQ for review. They just, they're turning over a report from a third party in many cases that indicate there's, there's no issue or what's the accountability factor of that or is there one? I think, I think that kind of relates to, to your first question. I'm, I'm gonna need to find out more about what's required by the AIR program um, I know in solid waste, we're not receiving that data. Um, in fact, I, you know, not, not too long ago, I received a, a FOIA where they were looking for some information that um, I, I think it was more data that the landfill would have versus data that was submitted to DEQ. Um, something similar, but I think it was a little different. But I'll, I'll look into those questions as it relates to our AIR program. I think that'll help, you know, uh, help, help you out a little bit. Appreciate that, and you may now continue your presentation uninterrupted, unless Mr. <laughs> uh, Holland has an yeah, item. Which is questions? Okay, I'm gonna get there. It, it, it was good timing. <laughs> <laughs> there, hey, you're down. there. I waited patiently for you to get there. Sure, sure. But anyway, man, the questions and comments have already been made quite well regarding our roads. Thank you, Mr. Engel. Regarding air quality, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. That was my question in terms of accountability. One question I have, I heard about the staff. I appreciate the question. Do you think you have adequate staff or you think you need more to do more robust testing, especially as it relates to air quality and the chemical composition of the air quality? Um, I think we need additional staff. Okay. Um, one of the things, you know, and I was discussing this with Scott earlier, one of the things our agency is, is working through is, you know, oftentimes when we hire positions, the most qualified people are internal candidates. Um, so you have a lot of folks kind of moving from one position to another. And then we also are dealing with a lot of retirements in, in the agency as well. Okay. Um, so even though we have a lot of positions that are currently open, our, our staffing level isn't increasing much. Um, I'm short a couple uh, uh, people in my program, including a solid waste inspector and then also a solid waste uh, permit writer, um, or two solid waste permit writers. But yes, I would, I would say additional staff would be helpful for sure. Yeah, I appreciate that comment. And of course, it, hopefully we can do all we can, Scott, as well, to help uh, the new administration, the new General Assembly, to make sure we fund the needed positions that need to be funded uh, in up and coming. So with your department, so thanks for suggesting that. And we look forward to working on you to achieve that goal. But thank you. Thank you for being all. here. Thank you. I'm sure you got more than you bargained for today. So appreciate you being here um, and uh, answering all these questions. Yeah, uh, Dr. Casey. Yeah, I, I, I would it. take as an example maybe of a follow up and homework assignment. You know, and again, what's our role as a county and in, in, in formal letters, formal letters from from board members uh, to again advocate for odor management plans and, and what may be our perception of a scope of such plan that may be maybe even beyond what the current rules are. And then I think we also recognize the fact that we can in the same letter or request of DEQ officials where the hierarchy is, is recognize it takes people to do um, the job. And, and whatever we can do to be a partner in helping with that or roles that can be delegated down if it needs to be down with, with those empowerment tools that, that are needed that we don't have from a state perspective. Uh, I think we can form, formulate something that you know, again, is being respectful of your side of the shop, but also advocating for it in the same breath. Sure. Great. Sure. Well, thank you. Back, by the way, too. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> what? And, He's jumping on that one, didn't he? Yeah, look at him. <laughs> well, and, and you know, I guess I'll just say I, I've I feel like I have I've only been in this position for about two and a half years, and I feel like I have a good working relationship with Chesterfield. I've worked a lot with Jeff Howard. I don't know if you are familiar with him, but. Um, he and I kind of keep each other updated on things, and that's worked out pretty well. Um, so I plan on continuing that. Thank you. Very knowledgeable. Thank you. Thank you all. Madam Clerk. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Casey, it's my pleasure to introduce Alex. She's our water quality manager for our pretreatment sections. She's going to go over some key aspects of our pretreatment program for your informational purposes.
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Casey. My name is Alex Tejas. I work for the Department of Utilities as a water quality manager, just like Mr. Morris said. Uh, I am very proud to be here to provide you an overview on how Chesterfield County protects the environment through our industrial waste pretreatment program. And let me tell you, this program remains a success um, due to the support that we receive from the board. And for that, we would like to express our gratitude. And let me see if I can handle this. <laughs> The Chesterfield County Pretreatment Program was established um, back in 1984. It's a federally mandated program, part of the Clean Water Act. And the purpose of the program is to protect aquatic life by preventing the introduction of pollutants into the wastewater system that may either bypass or interfere with our treatment plants. Also to protect the quality of our biosolids, the collection system, and the health and the safety of our workers. The way we control these pollutants in the sewer system is by issuing permits to what we call significant industrial users. As you know, um, both the Proctor's Creek and Falling Creek wastewater treatment plants are regulated by the Virginia DEQ through a BPDS permit. One of the many requirements in that permit is for Chesterfield to establish an industrial waste pretreatment program. So DEQ acts as the approval authority for the program while Chesterfield is the control authority. We currently have 33 uh, industries under pretreatment permit. 11 of those are considered what we call categorical industries. And what that means is that they have additional requirements that they have to comply with based on EPA regulations. As you can see on your screen, we have a great variety of um, industries in Chesterfield. Some of the products that are produced in Chesterfield, food and beverage, aluminum, recycling and forming, silicon and rubber products, industrial laundries, organic chemicals, synthetic fibers, just to name a few. Aside from managing this industrial users, the pretreatment staff also oversees food service establishments through our fats, oils, and grease program, as well as the, as the whole waste program um, at the Proctor's Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant. So what happens when an industrial uh, facility wants to connect to the sewer system? They have to go through a permitting process that starts with uh, a discharge application. On the screen, you can see a list of some of the things that are required in that application, and instead of reading through those, I'm going to tell you as, as an inspector, what are we looking for? We want to understand every single step of their manufacturing process to start with. What type of chemicals and raw materials are used? How are they stored? Do they have any spill prevention plans to control any accidental discharges? What are their end products? Do they have any byproducts, or do they generate any waste that, that they need to dispose of? If water is used in their manufacturing process, we want to know how is it used? What are the characteristics of the wastewater that they will be sending to us? What type of pollutants are present? What are the concentrations? And whether or not there's any specific regulations that apply to those pollutants or maybe to the whole industrial sector. If they are proposing to have a pretreatment program, I'm sorry, a pretreatment system to remove some of these pollutants, we also want to know what's involved in, in that process. Um, and how are they planning to maintain that, that, that system?
Once we uh, get that application sent to us, the evaluation process um, is done in a team effort. Pretreatment staff, plant manager, the development section in utilities, um, the director and assistant director of utilities um, help with this evaluation. And there are three key points that, um, that we, we take in consideration in that permitting process. We have to ensure that the discharge does not pass through or interfere with the treatment plant. Number two, that both of our plants are going to be compliant with their BPDS permit requirements. And number three, that the facility itself is able to comply with local limits, which have been approved by DEQ, and categorical standards, which are EPA um, requirements. If the project is approved, then pretreatment staff takes over the permit writing process. Our permits include general information, general requirements that basically mirror what's written in the sewer ordinance, but very specific requirements for the facility, such as flow limitations, local limits, categorical standards, self-monitoring requirements, and reporting requirements. Once they are in our program, the facility is required to self-monitor their wastewater on a continuous basis. And they send laboratory reports to us every three months. In addition to them self-monitoring, we are required by DEQ to monitor their wastewater too. On the screen, you can see one of our compliance technicians um, doing a, a sampling event. In 2021, pretreatment staff uh, conducted about 165 sampling events at our industrial facilities. In addition to those events, we also monitor commercial facilities for our fog program or as a response um, if we get an illicit discharge complaint. We also conduct sampling at our wastewater treatment plants, influent, effluent, and at different stages of the process in the, um, the septic hauler discharge station. In addition to the sampling, we are also required by DEQ to conduct inspections to all our permitted facilities. During those inspections, we make sure that the facility is complying with all their permit requirements, and also we review spill prevention control plans and slug discharge control plans. If we detect any non-compliance, we have an enforcement response plan that we have to follow. That plan has been approved by DEQ as well. And the enforcement actions vary from a simple verbal or written warning, depending on, on the severity of the, the non-compliance. We can escalate it to a formal notice of violation. And for chronic violations, we can go to an administrative order, penalties, and worst case scenario, termination of the permit. Every year, in January, we are uh, required also to submit uh, a report to DEQ with everything that has been done with this significant industrial users. And I was talking about enforcement and permit termination. But let me tell you, since I came to work in, to Chesterfield um, back in 2008, I've heard the same message from our director, from our pretreatment program manager, Instead of being just the regulator, Chesterfield County want, wants to be a partner with our industrial facilities. It's a win-win situation if we can help them be successful at what they do, and at the same time, they comply with our requirements. And um, that is the reason why Chesterfield County has established an awards program for our um, facilities in this um, under the pretreatment program. 
Just last year, 2021, we presented awards to 20 of our 33 significant industrial users. We normally do this in our uh, annual meeting, which happens in the fall, but due to the pandemic, we were forced to have a virtual meeting. And um, fortunately, some of our um, upper management uh, team and uh, staff were able to go to some of these facilities and present an award. Um, the awardees are uh, published in the newspaper and they are offered some monitoring exemptions. Um, as you can see on the screen, we have um, our director, um, Mr. Hayes, assistant director, Dr. Morris, our pretreatment program manager, Abba Sharma, who's here with us today, and compliance specialist, Chris DeRose, presenting an award at the folks at um, the Defense Supply Center, Richmond. And uh, with that said, I want to thank you for your time. This concludes my presentation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Board members' questions. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you. Our next work session is a real estate market update. Mr. Harris. Oh, sorry, Scott Smedley. Scott has a reprisal. We're, we're done. I'm good. That's good. <laughs> You're not getting off the hook that easy. Yeah. Nine. All right, well, that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time today. Good afternoon again, Mr. Chair, and members of the board. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to kind of review some of the environmental stewardship aspects of specifically the Swift Creek watershed with some of the upcoming zoning cases. I think it's important to talk about where we've been over the last couple of decades, where we are today, and some of the things that we need to keep in place and keep in mind as we move forward. Yeah. We're gonna get there. All right. So, um, you know, roughly 20 years ago, we adopted some more stringent standards for the Upper Swift Creek watershed. One of those was to have an increased phosphorus removal requirement for new development projects. And this mainly pertained to residential projects. So commercial projects still met the state standard, but residential projects had to meet a higher threshold of phosphorus removal. Also, all projects needed to have enhanced erosion and sediment control during construction. So when you see sediment basins on a construction site in the upper Swift Creek watershed, they have to be 25% larger so that we're capturing even more of that sediment runoff before it leaves the site. Also, super silt fence or an equivalent um, anionic PAM, which traps more sediment, and also flexible growth medium. So if you've ever seen hydro seed getting sprayed out, well, it's a kind of like a hydro seed with wood fibers in it, and it is a stronger, um, you know, hydro seed product, and it'll, you know, allow vegetation to grow more rapidly. Also in the Upper Swift Creek watershed, we have increased setbacks from the resource protection areas. So standard setbacks are 25 foot all across the county, but in the Upper Swift Creek watershed, we have a 35 foot setback requirement. Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. Haley. Could I, could I just interrupt and have you um, sort of define what the Upper Swift Creek rock watershed includes so that folks understand exactly what the parameters are of what we're talking about? Okay, so the Upper Swift Creek watershed is the watershed that specifically drains to the Swift Creek Reservoir. Um, and if I would have thought ahead, I would have had a nice little schematic of that watershed. But specifically, all of the river or streams 
that drain into the Swift Creek Reservoir. And those streams don't start in Chesterfield County in some cases, they start to the uh, west of us, correct? Correct, so there is a portion of Powhatan County that drains into the reservoir. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me, so it's, fair, it's a fairly large Yes, it is watershed a, that actually ends up right there. It is, it is a very large portion of the county. It's uh, one of the fastest growing portions of the county where most of the growth is. Thank you. Also, uh, there are increased floodplain setback requirements. So for properties that have more than 100 acres draining to the stream, behind their property, we have a 35-foot setback as compared to a 25-foot setback. So these increased setbacks push development further away from our bodies of water, reducing the risk of runoff then to those associated uh, drainage ways. Okay, yes, okay, thanks. Um, also within the Upper Sweep Crow Watershed, we have a requirement for a natural resources inventory. And that includes um, during the zoning stage of any project that all the resource protection areas have to be delineated, the floodplains have to be identified on the parcels, any wetlands need to be identified on the parcels, the highly erodible soils contained on the parcel need to be identified. Um, some of the others that you may have heard recently, slopes greater than 25% need to be identified. Um, endangered species, any mines that may be abandoned on the property, um, historical, archeological features also need to be identified. So that all needs to be done at the zoning stage rather than at the construction plan review stage. So outside of the Upper Swift Creek watershed in the other areas of the county, typically that's all done once a plan is submitted for review. But in the Upper Swift Creek watershed, we want those things identified during the zoning. You all may recall, and I've dealt with you on many drainage issues within your districts, that the county maintains all residential stormwater facilities, BMPs, in the county. In the Upper Swift Creek watershed, we also maintain all of the commercial stormwater facilities. Currently, um, across the county, we have about 560 stormwater facilities that we maintain. Um, and every year, we're adding about 80 new facilities to be maintained because of the significant amount of development and growth within the county. Mr. Chair. Ms. Haley. <laughs> and, and that, Mr. Smedley, that would involve redevelopment as well, correct? Yep. Because All redevelopment. If there's redevelopment going on on properties that were prior to the requirements of these BMPs, am I correct? That's correct. So if you've got a development that originally occurred in the 70s or 80s, maybe even the early 90s, and there was no stormwater facilities on site, it goes through a redevelopment process. They have to meet the new standards, and they you know, may have stormwater facilities on site at that time. Um, particularly if they're residential, they would get pulled into the county's maintenance inventory. So, good question. So, that's some of the you know, background related to criteria for development. I do wanna talk about the actual nutrient and water quality component. So as I mentioned, we had an increased phosphorus removal requirement for the Upper Swift Creek watershed. And then in 2014, we had a change in the stormwater sector. And as the DEQ representative, Mr. Weimer mentioned, Chesterfield County is the VSMP authority. You might remember when we adopted that ordinance and we you know, took on that program to review the stormwater plans and issue those construction permits, do the inspections. And so the difference 
going from the pre-2014 water quality removal requirements to the post-2014, you can see is that you're treating twice the amount of water. So you're going from a half an inch of rainfall, you're treating just from the impervious areas to treating one inch of rainfall over the entire site. So you're not just capturing the runoff from the streets, you're capturing the runoff from the managed turf, the streets, any associated you know, runoff from the property, and you're treating it to remove the phosphorus. So that's a big plus for the Upper Swift Creek watershed, because you might remember I said we weren't treating the commercial sites to a higher standard, but now we are. So any new commercial projects that have occurred since 2014 in the Upper Swift Creek watershed have to meet a much more stringent standard. And these new 2014 stormwater regs are on par with our previous requirements for the phosphorus removal. Um, the engineers doing projects in the Upper Swift Creek watershed for residential still have to run the calculations both ways, but most of the time they're within 95% of each other. So having commercial properties and industrial properties that have to meet this stringent standard is, is pretty significant and it's more protective of the reservoir. Yes, sir. So what products, for example, create the phosphorus that we're trying to prevent from actually getting into our water supply? If you, if you talk about what could be at a commercial uh, or industrial or even residential. So you have phosphorus naturally occurring in the soils and, it'll, and it gets bound to the sediment particles and you, know, you get runoff you know, in that way. In addition, you know, the amount of residential landscape that we have and the turf management aspect of you know, personal property owners you know, taking care of their lawns, lawn care companies taking care of you know, residential properties, um, you get quite a significant amount of runoff from those activities. And you, know, you can see it in the stormwater facilities, the ponds that we maintain, uh, particularly in the summertime, the algal blooms are significant. They're doing their job, they're removing those nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, um, but it's pretty significant. Uh, the industrial properties don't quite have the same level of turf management, typically, that residential properties do. So you're not going to see um, you know, the same level or the high levels of runoff because of that. But you, know, you could see um, you know, other products getting utilized. Um, you also you know, do get sediment you know, that gets accumulated on parking lots and you get phosphorus bound to that sediment. But typically you're gonna find that the residential lawns, the maintenance of those, is gonna have higher phosphorus loads. And that was one of the reasons the way the ordinance was adopted at that time. Well, yes, sir. Um, so parking lots pose a different risk, right? So if you have a car, for example, that has a leaky oil pan uh, or a leaky gas line or a leaky power steering fluid or any other fluid for that matter, uh, and that stuff actually gets in the parking lot when it rains, that actually washes, and that's a different issue than necessarily the phosphorus stuff. And the BMPs we put in place, I'm assuming that that is designed also to kind of prevent that from getting in a water supply? So if, if we see a project that's going to have a higher risk of petroleum runoff, um, you, some of you may remember certain proffers that we've asked for that provide some biofiltration or binding of those petroleum products. Typically, we don't ask for those type of things on standard parking lot runoff, but you are correct. You know, if you go out to a parking lot stormwater facility, you'll you know, more likely see potential of a sheen sometimes in those areas as compared to going into a residential neighborhood and looking at a stormwater pond. You're going to see a more significant green algal bloom in the residential neighborhood as compared to if you go out to any shopping center stormwater facility. You, you are highly likely to, to find something like that. So as I was talking about with the um, Okay, 
Um, lastly, looking at the health of the reservoir. Um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations over many years about the health of the reservoir, concerns from residents and citizens about, you know, save the reservoir, don't pollute the reservoir type of um, messaging. And it's important to note that through the housing boom of the mid-2000s, the housing boom over the last five years, we have continued to maintain a very healthy reservoir, both from a water quality side and also from an ecosystem of the fisheries within the reservoir. Uh, one of my employees' spouse is a um, fisheries and wildlife employee. Um, he actually goes out and samples and shocks and, and you know, counts the fish. Um, so it's a very healthy ecosystem, and that's a benefit to all the residents and Chesterfield County. So the criteria as to how this health is measured is the state Virginia code has criteria for man-made lakes and reservoirs. And specifically what we're looking at is the amount of chlorophyll and the amount of phosphorus in the reservoir. If the reservoir isn't treated with algicides to control algae, then you strictly just look at chlorophyll. But since utility departments manages the reservoir for the water quality, they do spot treat areas in the reservoir for algal blooms. And so as such, phosphorus is included in that. And phosphorus becomes your dictating criteria, so to speak, that you want to look at. And the utilities department has done an excellent job over the years of, you know, with their monitoring in the reservoir. And then we take that data and produce an annual report. So in 2020, the phosphorus measured in the reservoir was 0.031, and the threshold for concern is 0.04. And if you have two years of 0.04 measured by DEQ, not the county, then DEQ will you know, look at it more closely and decide whether it's an impaired water body. So the reservoir is 50 years old, We've got 50 years of development around the reservoir. We have protective measures put in place, and we still have excellent water quality and a very healthy ecosystem. And that's no message to understate because we have had very significant growth in that part of the county. And I think it's you know, proven that the measures that we have in place are protective of water quality and the ecosystem out there. I also will mention that Utilities has done an excellent job of managing hydrilla in the reservoir. Um, you know, they've, they've managed it in such a way that it's, you know, you're not seeing vast swings in water quality and you're not seeing vast swings in the vegetation, the natural vegetation, aquatic vegetation, and you're not seeing, you know, massive swings in the fish population. So it's very important that we take all these things into consideration. So, um, we've got the 2021 data. We have not written the report yet, but a cursory overview uh, shows that, you know, last year's data was 0 0.037. So we're, we're continuing on a good trajectory, and I, I, that's the message I really want to leave with you all today. Um, lastly, for Mr. Winslow, tree canopy. Thank you so much. My, my, my annual plug for, as you look at zoning cases and the importance of planning in our residential neighborhoods, the importance of tree canopy and, you know, and, and livable communities, aesthetically pleasing. You know, not only is it that, but from a stormwater perspective, these tree canopies really do go a long way to reducing runoff, slowing runoff, in our residential communities. So with that, I will be happy to answer any more questions. And, and the slow, slowing down of all of the rainfall is important because of erosion and all of these nutrients it, getting it, flushed into. It traps, the tree canopy traps the water, prevents it from hitting the ground. That prevents runoff from occurring collecting more nutrients and sediment 
into our stormwater facilities and ultimately the adjacent waterways. Thank you, and, and you know, we did pass a little, um, I didn't get any fair, fanfare for it, I would say, but we did pass up an ordinance a couple of years ago that required street trees in the Upper Swift Creek watershed. And so this is, um, the, these types of uh, efforts, uh, as well as the county's longstanding commitment and uh, that ordinance passed that Jet was cited earlier, have really done a nice job. And you just have to look at this and go, our utilities department and our environmental engineering department are doing a fantastic job for citizens when it comes to water quality and longevity of a reservoir that, that as you point out, is, is I guess celebrating its uh, its 50 year mark. So thank you. Thank you, Scott. Now we can get to the real estate market update, Mr. Harris. Not, not quite. One Mr. Bowles. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave the real estate to others. For the so, uh, <laughs> so, hey, can we get Sarah a coffee? Somebody get Sarah a coffee, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Casey, uh, beyond the efforts of utilities envir and environmental engineering, uh, several other county departments engage in various environmental stewardship efforts. Um, the Department of General Services led energy management program uses a combination of strategies to improve energy efficiency and overall sustainability. Uh, this is illustrated through the energy management pyra pyramid, which demonstrates that complexity and cost of energy actions typically increase as you move from conservation to energy efficiency and finally to alternative energy projects. Um, all of these uh, functions that we do are in close coordination with schools and utilities as they are the other largest consumers of energy outside of county government operations. Uh, data analysis is a key component of energy management effort, efforts and involves continual collection and review of consumption and expense, expense trends, uh, which we do through a system called Energy Cap so that we can identify and investigate any unusual deviations. Uh, the county is also part of the Vir Virginia Energy Purchasing Governmental Associ Association, which uh, negotiates electricity contracts on behalf of 170 local government members. Uh, ultimately saving taxpayers throughout the Commonwealth millions of dollars each year. A uh, couple of programs to mention, Chesterfield Unplugged, which is an award-winning employee-focused program, seeks to educate our employees on energy conservation uh, and achieve ongoing reductions in en energy usage through building their knowledge. Uh, in fleet services, we're currently operating 84 liquid propane powered vehicles. And since the inception of this program in fiscal 13, we've achieved just over $376,000 in fuel cost avoidance uh, and achieved a, a reduction of just under uh, 5.9 million pounds of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, through a partnership with Dominion Energy, uh, Chesterfield Schools and General Services, we now have two electric powered school buses in service. Uh, they've only been operating a short time, uh, but as this program matures, we expect to have additional data to report back to the board. Uh, in terms of some current initiatives, uh, as we talked about a few months ago, the County and School Solar PPA project is in its due diligence phase. Um, you know, like many contractors, our partner, Sun Tribe Solar, is encountering some materials and supply chain challenges, uh, but we're going to continue to work with them to better understand those challenges and the overall impact on the project. Uh, we also uh, have a major maintenance project now underway to improve exterior lighting uh, on the county complex as well as in the outlying facilities. Uh, beyond energy management and cost-saving ben benefits, these projects are going to enhance security uh, for our employees and visitors to the county facilities, um, as well as reduce maintenance requirements for, for buildings and grounds. Um, 
We have a multidisciplinary group from capital projects, buildings and grounds, and security management actively working on this project now uh, to finalize the scope and, and cost estimates so that we can move this forward to uh, final specification development and procurement. Uh, and finally, uh, working with our technology partners, I mentioned Energy Cap to do some system upgrades uh, that's going to allow some more, uh, greater efficiencies in the data import process, uh, which ultimately will help us uh, do that data analysis work that I, that I mentioned earlier. And uh, just quickly before closing, uh, I did want to mention the, the county's environmental stewardship website which can be found under the My Community Quick Links uh, section of chesterfield.gov. Uh, this page provides a lot of excellent information about the environmental and sustainability efforts of all the departments um, in several categories. Uh, on that page, you can also find our full energy management report for calendar year 2021. With that, I'm happy to take any questions the board may have. Board members. Thank you, Clay, and I um, uh, also want to thank staff because I know we've had some good conversations recently about uh, replacing uh, traditional street lights with, mm -hmm. um, 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 what am I trying to say, energy efficient bulbs, and, and so I appreciate very much those efforts going on and, and all of the work in this area because it's important long term, as has been mentioned uh, by citizens in front of this body. So thanks very much for that. Appreciate you. Thank you.